You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. And now, it's time for the show that breaks down the options market. From unusual activity alerts to market analysis, strategy overviews, listener questions, and much more. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. It's time to hit the option block with your host, Mark Longo from the Options Insider Media Group and co-hosts Uncle Mike Tussaud from RCM Asset Management, Andrew the Rock Lobster Joe Venazzi from OptionPit.com, and Mark the Greasy Meatball Sebastian from OptionPit.com. And now, get ready to hit the Option Block. All right, everybody. That music means we're back. Yup, it's Thursday, it is noon central, it is 1 p.m. Eastern, it is time for the Option Block. My name is Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, from this fun network. Glad so many of you are enjoying our content throughout the week. No live stuff last couple of days, just having challenges getting guests through with all the interviews and everything else and all the things going on back east, weather-related, still dealing with a lot of fallout there. Of course, you got your shows, nonetheless, you got Advisors Option on Tuesday on the old network, and of course, yesterday you got your OB and your OPR. So a lot of fun stuff hitting the network, pretty much multiple shows a day. If you're not subscribed to the full network, listeners, hey, what are you doing? You're missing out on a bunch of stuff. Get over there wherever you're listening to this and subscribe to the full network. And B, if you like what you hear, leave a review so others can continue to discover this options fire hose <laughs> that is the network. And keep those questions and comments coming. We do love to hear from you guys. And joining me on the program today, first... It's quiet out there. Some may say it's tranquil, perhaps even idyllic. Yes, it is St. Charles, Illinois, where we are joined once again by Uncle Mike Tussaud from the appropriately named St. Charles Wealth Management. Uncle Mike, welcome back to the program on this kind of weird mix Thursday, sir. Weird mix kind of describes 2020 from what I could tell. Yeah. Great to be here as always. (laughs) You could probably put both of those adjectives together as well as many more to describe the year that has been. Thinking back to January, everyone was so excited. Not just a new year, but a new decade. It held so much promise. Everyone was like, wow, a new decade. Here we go. We're doing cool stuff, kicking off new things. Look at the roaring 20s 100 years ago. Those were so great. (laughs) So far, we had about a week or two of optimism, and then it kind of all just rolled off a cliff from there. 2020s, yeah. All right. (laughs) Also joining us. You know he's a source of optimism whenever we bring him on the show. Just nothing but rays of sunshine. He is the greasiest meatball, soon to be perhaps the the cooked chili, the smoked brisket. We shall find out. Mr. Mark Sebastian from OptionPit.com by way of Carmen Lyon Capital, by way someday soon of Austin. Mr. Meatball, welcome back to the program, sir. Yeah, it's good to be here. Uh, It's an exciting day for the markets. It's an exciting day for to be alive. Lots of, uh, lots of little news out there that's creating, uh, some funness. And, uh, uh, you know, obviously the, the most funness of all funness is the option block. Ah, yes. The funness, (laughs) the funness is back. So let's get to it. Listeners. Let's kick off the mail block. That'd be the end of the show. Let's kick off the trading block. It's time to break down the latest topics, trades, and trends in the world of options. It's time for The Trading Block. 
All right, everybody, welcome to the trading block. This is where we begin our journey looking at what's trade and what's lighting it up in the old markets. As I alluded to Uncle Mike, kind of a weird mixed session here towards the latter portion of the week. You know, most of the rest of the week, it was rally ho mode yesterday, firmly in the rally ho seat on the behalf of, you know, vaccine optimism, you know, disease coronavirus based optimism. Uh, rallying hard on the day when Biden announced his VP pick, even though a lot of people thought she wasn't really very pro-market, uh, yet that didn't seem to really weigh on the markets at all yesterday. Huge rally. Today, taking perhaps a bit of a well-deserved breather, a bit of a cautious step forward. The mar- markets, most of the major indices, pretty much mixed on the day. Dow, a.k.a. the old world economy, even though it's going harder and harder to make those distinctions the way these indexes have kind of blurred the lines a little bit. But looking at the old school lens, it's the old world economy. It's off about a tenth of a point, a little more than that, a tenth of a percentage point, I should say. S&P up about a tenth of a percentage point. So both of them moving in lockstep in opposite directions. And then we got NASDAQ once again leading the charge, this time to the upside, up over three quarters of a point, up about 0.86% out there. And of course, we got our old friend, the Russell 2000, at least through the IWM lens, Actually a lagger today, only up about a quarter of a percent out there. Usually most days it's moving and shaking more. If you want to hear more about all things small cap, of course, uh, stay tuned to Twifo coming up after this show. Get into that. We're going to have some great guests joining us to break down what's going on in the world of futures, options across a broad spectrum of products. Right now gold's up, but it's still shy of that 2,000 level again, so it broke back below that. And crude's still up, even though it's down on the day today. Still up north of that 40 handle, about 42 and a quarter. And of course, our old friend Vix Cash effectively unched from our last show. It's down about a quarter. Uh, so it was at about 21 and a half kicking off the show here, which puts it pretty much almost exactly where it was uh, this time last show. Our old friend V Vix actually up a bit. We have seen some vol of vol since our last show. It's up to about 113 and a half or so to kick off the show. That puts it up a little over three handles, about three and a half handles. And VXX still down to the dark side, threatening that 25 handle yet again, 25 and a quarter. Down about two-thirds of a point out there. And if you're wondering, you know, is this my time? A lot of you have been asking us about these lofty valuations. This kind of, I've often joked that the market has been whistling past the graveyard for some time. If you're wondering, is this my time to get out? Well, maybe this will be the iron in your fire to, to drive you out. Of course, everyone's favorite. Depends, I guess, which side of the aisle you fall on. If you're on the right, then he's your favorite boogeyman of all time. If you're on the left, maybe you like him. If you're from a financial markets perspective, maybe you love him or hate him. Of course, this is George Soros. It is amazing to see how this guy's just become this specter looming over everything, this boogeyman. Everyone thinks he has his tendrils and everything out there. Well, he's out. If you're wondering what's his thought on this market, he is out. He said this market, which he no longer participates in, he says, is sustained by the expectation of more fiscal stimulus along with the hopes that Trump will announce a vaccine before November. Obviously, take his political views with a little bit of a grain of salt. You know what axes he has uh, to grind there. People keep talking about, whenever they mention Soros, they say, oh, he made a killing showing the pound. He did. That was a long time ago. He also, maybe less heralded, but one we remember more, is he probably had one of the worst timing with equity bubbles, maybe ever. That maybe the one guy or maybe came in and stepped in and bought all the tulips right before the tulip bubble crashed. Soros famously held off on buying into the tech bubble until about March of 2000. And then he not big fanfare. Hey, we're getting in. My funds are getting in. And guess what happened in March of 2000? It was probably one of the worst timed buy-in decisions in history. Uh, so maybe take his decision here with a grain of salt. Uh, I know it's kind of hard to look at Soros outside of the political lens. Everyone has these political viewpoints of him these days. But that said, if you needed maybe irons to stay in the fire or get the heck out of the fire, Soros is out. Make of it what you will. And if that's not enough for you, because of course, I mentioned we got the VP nominee. Kind of a weird reaction to her. I mean, Kamala Harris, not really widely viewed as some sort of really pro-market type uh, type. Of course, these days, looking at progressives on the Democrat ticket, you don't expect to see a lot of pro-market nominees anyway. So maybe she's the best of a bad field, at least when it comes to looking at from a pure markets lens out there. But the market rallied on her, so maybe that's something. But uh, that's not enough of a sign that maybe, maybe, maybe you think things are better. Well, then AMC agrees with you. They're coming back in a week, exactly a week. They're reopening their theaters August 20th to coincide with their 100th year of operations. And they're going to charge the 1920 price of 15 cents a ticket. So if you needed some incentive to go back and sit in a crowded theater with other people in the midst of a pandemic, 
maybe 15 cents will do it. So a lot to unpack there. Let's go the opposite of the way we came. Let's start with Mr. Meatball. Mr. Meatball, we had a weird week. We got a VP pick, the market rallies. Uh, we got theaters coming back. <laughs> we got Soros getting the heck out of Dodge. What's catching your eye out there today, sir, in the midst of what did you call it, the funness? You know, it's amazing how many of these big fund managers missed the boat in 2000, right? He's not the only one that bought really poorly timed. Didn't Druckenmiller as well miss pretty darn badly on, uh, on, uh, on the, the tech bubble as well and a few other people? So, you know, it, it's very difficult, uh, you know, even for smart people to get things exactly right. Um, I don't entirely disagree with some of his logic. Um, you know, we now have a situation where uh, Apple is going to the bond market to fund a giant amount of stock buybacks. And, you know, you got to ask yourself what, you know, I think that's the kind of the more interesting question is, all right, what, what implications does, does that really mean for the stock market that, you know, that type of behavior is going on in the bond market where, you know, companies used to load, load going to the bond market. And daily, my dog does too. She loathes the bond market. And, um, and so, you know, that's interesting. And then Kamala Harris, our, uh, which, which means creator of wealth in Indian. I was reading in the Wall Street Journal. So she is of, of Jamaican and Indian descent. She is half, in, uh, I believe, half Indian. Well, that's why we rally. Uh, She's going to create wealth for all of us. Now I understand. Yeah. Kamala means creator of wealth in, uh, in, in Indian. And uh, my understanding is it's a synonym for Lakshmi. That's what they were saying in the Wall Street Journal. So I, uh, I, I can tell you this. If you're making trades for or against the market because of a candidate for office, you are making a bad decision. I think no matter what your, your political uh, leanings are, um, making those types of decisions will cost you a lot of money long term. Uh, I've n- never met anybody that made a good investment decision because of their political leanings. And, uh, and uh, that, that continues to grow. I mean, I think we've had guests on from both sides of the aisle and, and at all the, all we ever happen, we've had liberals and conservatives over the last 40, 50 years. And the market has just essentially gone up. So, uh, that's just something to be aware of, especially with interest rates as low as they are. So that, that's kind of what I'm, I'm paying attention to. Um, you know, I know we'll talk about this more in detail, but, uh, past guests, Scott Nations, his uh, Nation Share Ball Q finally uh, looks like it's going to get a list. So, con- little little congrats to uh, to Scott. He's a, a nice guy, and I'm happy to to see something come of his uh, his thoughts. And um, yeah, I mean that's uh, we continue to see silver and gold off to the races, and uh, and Bitcoin, so and Ethereum. So the they're there, the weak dollar trade continues to be a, a crowded trade. Yeah, Mark, I, I don't, maybe your, your brand of humor is not resonating with our audience today because they're not getting it. We have a uh, – looks like regular listener here, Studini. I've seen him in there before. He's, he's not feeling it, Mark. He says, funness is not a word. So he's very, uh, very offended at your choice of grammar. By the way, that's the joke, Studini. It's not a word, of course. <laughs> that's what makes it funny. But hey. Uh, Mr. Meatball, you know the, he's not you feeling told, your grammar today. You told him the internet wasn't a word 20 years ago, and now it is. So, uh, you know, TikTok wasn't a word. So <laughs> if I say it's a word, it's a GD word, all right? You well, you, you back off, you. If Trump has his way, TikTok may not be a word again. Uh, but, yeah, sometimes you like to play with a little bit of the grammar and the vernacular out there. At least the meatball does. I, I've been known to jump into that arena myself, which is what makes funness so fun. It's not a word. We agree with you. All right. So that's, that's the joke. Just When you have to say the joke, it loses some of the fun. But say la vie. <laughs> Let's keep on rolling. Mr. Uncle Mike, sir, a lot to unpack this week for you as well. What is on your radar? What is lighting up your tape today? Well, first off, I think we have some fake news out there, Mark. Um, and all of our 
uh, 80s WWF faithful will agree with me on this. Because uh, I don't know if the fake news is from the mainstream media, both the both Fox and CNN. I'm not trying to be political here, or or whether it was uh, from uh, the WWF webs or the WWE website. But uh, I thought Kamala, the Ugandan giant, I thought he died uh, a few years ago, uh, the one that fought <laughs> Hulk Hogan back in the old days. But now now he's a vice president nominee. What's going on? Amazing that? how that works from the WWE to the White House. Has there been a greater American story, sir? Um, I don't think he's eligible, though, because he's from Uganda, isn't he? But he's not even yeah. alive. He's from Uganda What's and also here, dead, Mark? both of which would probably disqualify him. The latter probably more so. I actually think he, he passed away almost the same day as uh, Kamala became VP, and it created all kinds of confusion in the Twitter sphere. Well, here's so, where uh, the confusion even gets greater, because if you're dead, you're eligible in Chicago, though, aren't you? Oh! <laughs> yeah. How about... How about how about Madigan getting hit with a, well, you know what, we don't want to go into Illinois politics. So, no, uh, we don't. We do not bring up Madigan. That's a rabbit hole we cannot recover from, sir. Yeah, no, there's no way. Good point. All right. But anyway, uh, shout out to all my WWE faithful out there. But anyway, uh, so yeah, you, we touched the all-time highs yesterday, or we looked like we may close it, uh, or come close to them, and uh, couldn't quite pull the trigger yesterday, and so we might make another run at today. So I think right now, in the marketplace, that's the next big barrier for uh, more wealth going or more um, <clears throat> uh, resistance going forward uh, with the S and P 500 at this point. Uh, silver took a big hit earlier this week, but it's uh, recovering very nicely today. Uh, so it's a lot of volatility going on in the silver space at this point in time, and uh, it's you could say rightfully so with all the uh, everything that's happening in our world these days. Uh, Type of uh, another stimulus of some sort. Some people are calling on for calling for greater unemployment benefits, uh, which, from what Trump did in the executive order about a week ago, I mean, I don't know if this is going to go through or not. Another three hundred dollars a week, as opposed to the previous six hundred, with the expectation that individual states are going to pay the four hundred. Uh, there's uh, continued confusion right now over whether the um, uh, the uh, payroll tax deferral is going to go into effect, whether it's just going to be deferred, whether it's going to be forgiven, or how that's going to work in general. Uh, so still not a lot of clarity with that. And then um, you know, over, the week, over the past weekend, when the president said that he was looking to possibly just abolish the payroll tax, uh, what does that mean? Does that mean he's going to get rid of Social Security? Um, does that mean that he's just going to fund it other ways? Uh, just a lot of confusion that's happening right now uh, on both sides of the aisle, quite frankly. With the VP nominee that we have now, uh, we have that into play. And uh, I think it's going to be a very interesting debate season coming up. And I just want to reiterate what Mark was saying uh, when he was talking about how you really shouldn't uh, place investments based upon who's in office. I went through this a couple of weeks ago, uh, the strategy block in that the market has done well and the market has done poorly, uh, regardless of who's in office. But for the most part, like Mark said, over the long term, the market's gone up and there's uh, little tidbits to or little spots in history to where you can say, Oh, those stinking Democrats, they made the market go down or, Oh, those stinking Republicans, they made the market go down. But ultimately, uh, they've both pl pl played a role in this. And uh, like I've said before as well, America is much bigger than one office. Uh, we're the greatest country in the world and we have checks and balances and we have three branches of government uh, to balance things regardless of who's in the White House. So we have all those things going on and uh, going into election season. Uh, I think this is going to be very interesting to see just how market re markets react, because uh, I do think markets will react in ways, depending on who's doing better or who's doing worse in the polls, and not necessarily the market as a whole, but, well, at sometimes the market as a whole, but I think that uh, just various sectors of the market could react, depending on who is doing better or who is doing worse within the polls, and um uh, to add to it, uh, the Big Ten, when they announced that they weren't going to be having college football for sure on Monday or the other day, uh, that's when uh, we had a sharp drop in the market right at that time. Uh, people don't think it's as big of a deal as I do, but we're going to be hurting a lot of economies throughout the country if we do not have big time college football. Now, as sad as it is that uh, Division Two and Division Three football are done, uh, that's really not going to have quite a, as much of an economic impact on things. But towns like Columbus, Ohio, towns like Champaign, Illinois, uh, towns like Bloomington, Indiana, and all the 
big tent towns that are very dependent upon revenue coming into their towns when college football comes to town, they're going to be hurt pretty bad. Uh, the, the football stadium for the University of Nebraska is actually the third biggest city in the state of Nebraska. And when now, you're taking Mike, that away, to be, to, that's going to hurt. I do want to make one, cor- I do want to make one correction there, Mike. They have not had big time college football in Champaign, Illinois or Bloomington, Indiana, in maybe, maybe 30, 40 years. Uh Uh-oh. Fighting words. Okay, you got me there. Shots fired. (laughs) Shots fired. Our producer is from U of I. You may accidentally be knocked off the program somehow throughout the show. I'm just laying that out there for you. But, yeah, those are the things that are going on. And uh, as we continue to delve into this program, uh, we're delving through chaos, as we do in all programs these days, it seems. Yeah, it's kind of hard to have a show that isn't somehow delving through chaos. These That's another good title for the show, Delving Through Chaos, <laughs> as the funness abounds out here. Let's see what kind of funness is hitting the markets here. Uh, Vic's doing decent paper as of a few minutes ago. Uh, the ADB is about uh, a little over 300K right now, 319, so it's gotten even lighter since our last show. So it is threatening that 300K level, which... Ain't looking good for volume-wise. Of course, this is that time of year when you'd expect that, but this is, of course, not a normal year. So all bets are off when it comes to pretty much anything in the market right now. A VIX at about 176,000 contracts as of a few minutes ago, so decent paper. Looks like it may beat that ADV today if we stay on this pace here. SPY at about exactly one and three quarters million contracts. The ADV, 3.61 million out there. The S, 391,000 contracts. That's pretty anemic. That's also reflected in the ADV. It's threatening 900K to the dark side now. It's at 902 right now. So the S, well shy of a million contracts a day and threatening to go lower. The Q's, 540,000. The ADV, 1.05 million out there right now. And IWM, as of a few minutes ago, I think I got about 151,000. The ADV is 524,000. It's pretty light in IWM as well. Let's move on out to the top 10. Decent, uh, decent paper in the single names out there. Cost you a buck fifty-four to get into the top ten. One hundred fifty-four thousand, of course. I get you all the way across the street to Boeing here. Number nine, Micron, one hundred eighty-four thousand. Number eight, Space. Good old SPCE. Excuse me. Yeah, easy for me to say. SPCE. I haven't seen them in the uh, in the top ten in some time. That is, of course, Virgin galactic out there that's uh trading right now 1905 up 88 cents so a good little run for them up, up nearly five percent that's good enough for 185,000. number eight on our list number seven microsoft 203,000. number six facebook 207,000. number five boeing symbol buddy bank of america 215,000. so separate again today a rare divergence for the two of them number four amd it's always in the top 10 these days there it's number four two hundred twenty nine thousand. number three cover your ears uncle mike it is cisco your lifelong nemesis three hundred fifty thousand contracts then we jump up quite a bit to number two here good old tesla six hundred and twenty two thousand contracts on the tape for tesla right now then you know the top two names the last few Episodes here have just been blowing the doors off, and Tesla doing the exact up seventy three and a half handles. Both Tesla and Apple having renounced stocks, announced stock splits. Obviously, that's been good for their underlying. They've been on the rampage up seventy one, almost seventy two handles, up nearly five percent again today. Tesla at sixteen twenty six and a half. Uh, it's hard to even say that with a straight face. Yet there it is, six hundred twenty two thousand contracts on the tape. Seventy one percent of that coming on the call side. But you know what? Number one beats both of those. Apple, 890,000 contracts out there. It is so funny how you just have to announce a a stock split. And this prospect of the stock getting cheaper makes people really excited and get want to buy it and make it more expensive. It's one of those weird counterintuitive market trends out there. Yet Apple and Tesla bearing this trend out yet again. Apple up nine and a third or a little over 2% to 461 and 40 or so out there. It's good for 890,000 contracts, 74% of that coming on the call side of the ledger. So Apple's almost number one. It's tied with Microsoft for number two, actually, in terms of bias paper. Number one, actually, good old Virgin Galactic, 78% of that, 185,000 contracts. Coming on the call side of the ledger. Let's pop in really quickly to see what's popping off here from an earnings perspective. Remember, you can get all these reports for yourself in your hot little hands completely for free. TheOptionsInsider.com is the place to go. Click on that Options News 
and articles tab. Of course, you can click around there while you're there. Click on the various shows. Check out our live schedule. Check out some of our social media and tweets on there. All sorts of fun stuff to do in between episodes over there. The Options Insider. A lot of you come for the network, but hey, we got a whole website there you can check out as well. Uh, Monday, we had Marriott and Canopy Growth. Wednesday, that's why they're moving, of course. Good old Cisco and Lyft. Uh, today, we got NetEase, which is the Chinese video game name. And then we got AMAT after the bell. And then tomorrow, DraftKings. Let's see, we got some move results reports as of this morning. So, hot off the presses, Cisco. They were reporting last night after the bell. They closed at 48.10 going into their announcement. They were pricing in 5.2%. And guess what, listeners? We talked about this trend of kind of underpricing vol and then under-delivering on it from a vol perspective this season. Well, Cisco bucking that trend. They're off, as of the time of this report, they were off 11.7%. So more than doubling their straddle. And let's see where they are right now, listeners. About 11.5% almost. So they have extended that to the dark side there. So Cisco blowing the doors off their straddle. One of the few names that has left uh, premium buyers <laughs> looking happy. Usually it's the opposite. I think as Matt termed it earlier this week on the advisor's option, this has been a bloody season for options and indeed premium buyers out there. Let's see if Lyft can keep the trend alive. Lyft had announced after the bell yesterday as well. They went into their earnings $30.52. They were pricing in 10.1%, so pretty rich. Probably a lot of that coming on the heels of what Uber just did. They obviously pricing in a little bit of juice for Lyft. And, <laughs> nope, right back to the same old script. They delivered 5.1%, so exactly half, pretty much, of their straddle. Let's see where they are right now. Off 3.5%, so they've even come back more. So yet another example where premium buyers getting the short end of the stick. The last two cycles, if you had told me coming in, I've said this before, but if you told me if there are any couple of cycles particularly last cycle, where you think you probably want to have a little bit of premium in your back pocket going to earnings season. It was probably the last one, and maybe this one. And yet, that has been one of the worst trades uh, so far that we've seen. We've got, let's see, AMAT after the bell today. So obviously, we don't know their results, but we can look at what the report is pricing out here. 66 and a half is where they were at the time of this report. They were pricing in $3.22. In the past, they moved two seventy eight. so a little bit rich on AMAT. Let's see what else we've got. Walmart was before the bell. Actually, it was next week on the 18th, so they have a little bit more time to go. They were at almost 132, but 131.90. They were pricing in 532, and in the past, they moved 544, so not much really of note there in Walmart. A DraftKings, a name we haven't talked about before here. They're on the 14th, so tomorrow before the bell. Let's see. They were at 33.74 as of the time of this report, and uh, 334 is what they're pricing in, and we don't even have past data for this name. It's so new. Uh, so yeah, interesting stuff here. We don't know. This is our first real bit of analysis for DraftKings from an earnings perspective. So we'll see how they're doing. But so far, pricing in $3.34. If you want those names, let's do one more because it's a big one. It's popping off next week. This is NVIDIA. That was the bellwether for many names on the mobile front with their mobile chips. Of course, on the crypto front for a while. Who knows what NVIDIA is the bellwether for now? Many things. <laughs> but so let's see. Coming into this report, it was at four fifty seven sixty one. They were pricing in $28.87, so pretty juicy. And looks pretty juicy compared to their past straddles as well. In the past, they've moved twenty five eighty nine. So in regards to their previous earnings announcements and their earnings moves, this looking a little rich. Of course, if they uh, play the same pattern everything else has this cycle, that's going to be a bloodbath for the people who buy that straddle. So that's just a handful of those. You can check out the earnings move, earnings move results. And, of course, the earnings season. I don't even have time to get into that. We have the whole season broken down for you as well. I'm looking at it right now. A lot of red on that report, listeners. Check it out for yourselves over there, theoptionsinsider.com, courtesy of our friends over there in Orat's land. Meanwhile, it's time for us to keep on rolling. It's time to get weird. It is time for the Odd Block. It's time to break down the most interesting, unusual, and downright questionable options activity that's been identified by TheOptionsInsider.com. It's time for The Odd Block. All right, everybody. Let's do it. Let's get weird. Let's get wild. Let's get odd. Let's kick things off, not just unleashing our eye of Sauron. He'll come in a little bit. But let's go back 
to see what some of our Eye of Sauron found for us in the past. In this particular case, it's a pretty sizable one. We're going to go back to July 2nd in our old friend GM. I haven't talked about GM in a while, probably since this, this day here of July 2nd. It's not, not a usual name to pop up our unusual activity radar. We'll get to where GM is trading right now in a second because it's a bit of a spoiler. But on, the, on July 2nd, we profile what looked like a pretty sizable, pretty near-term risk reversal going up in the weeklies. In particular, it was the August expiring on the 7th, so not even the traditional monthly August, 26 half, 25, what looked like a bullish risk reversal at the time, going up 70,000 times for the two, 25 puts, excuse me, for a buck 29, it was pretty much right on the bid, and 71,500 times, so a little bit more on the call side for a buck 10 lifting the offer there. So it had all the hallmarks of your traditional bullish risk reversal, selling the put, buying the call, pretty tight one and a pretty near term one. That made it interesting because you don't see these types of trades going up for this type of size this close to expiration. This one had a little bit over a month to go. Usually these types of size, I like to position a little bit more, a little bit further out. But this guy doing it for about a month and change here. As of the trade date, the stock closed at 25 and a quarter. So those 25 puts... That line in the sand was, was fairly aggressive. And they did it, let's see, they did it for about, looks like a 19 cent credit. They sold the puts for a buck 29, bought the calls, as it seems, for a buck 10. And so as this thing went on, they had to sweat it a little bit because the stock dropped during the time of this trade down to a low of a little bit shy of 23 and a half, 23.42. So this guy was wearing it for over a buck, about a buck and a half on those puts. So he probably was sweating this one. Maybe that kind of size, maybe he wanted to buy himself some GM because it was a pretty tight Risk reversal as well, which made it kind of interesting from that perspective as well. Of course, these expired on the 7th. If you fast forward to the 7th, they were not open anymore. So this guy went and took this bad boy off. He did it on the 4th. So a few days before expiration, uh, looks like he did it buying back the calls. I'm sorry, selling out the calls for 16 cents and buying back the puts for 14 cents. Looks like he put it on for a 19 cent credit and took it off for a 2 cent credit. So you're talking about 21 cents for this guy about 70,000 times. So in the neighborhood of one and a half million, it seems like. So he had to sweat for it. But it seems like he didn't want the stock after all. And, of course, he took it off. So interesting stuff. Mr. Meatball, an interesting one, a sizable one, a fairly near-term, fairly tight bullish risk reversal, which is kind of interesting in and of itself. Uh, Do you concur with this? Do you think maybe something else was afoot here, sir? No, I mean, that's what it looks like, is a, a really near-dated bullish risk reversal. You think our guy is sitting pretty to the tune of $1.5 million, sir? He, I, he must be. I think that's, I mean, it might, it's probably against the stock position, obviously. But, yeah, I mean, that that's, sounds like what he's, what he's trying to accomplish. Sounds like he didn't want to get that stock after all. He must have been sweating a little bit. So he had to work for his $1.5 million listeners. But we like to go back and check out some of the sizable prints we look at how they unfolded in the marketplace, at least just purely from the options lens. He probably has underlying or something else on against this, obviously, but from a purely options perspective, uh, this trade seemed like it worked out. He took it off pretty deftly, too, and he was still able to get a little bit of a credit for this thing. Put it on for credit, take it off for credit. There are worse things in life. (laughs) All right, let's move on to what our Eye of Sauron has in its crosshairs today. This one I don't believe we've had on the odd block. If we do, it's not ringing a bell with me. This is Glue Mobile, ticker symbol Glue, G-L-U, not Gru from the Minions franchise, Inspicable Me. That would be cool, but no, it's Glue. (laughs) Uh, Ticker symbol G-L-U-U, so they added a U over there. This is a mobile game developer out of San Fran. Expensive place to be a mobile game developer these days. Maybe you want to move, save some of those office costs. But Glue Mobile trading today seven dollars and seventy-five cents, up about not even twenty cents, but about two and a quarter percent out here. So this is your resident cheapy. If you want a cheap name here, listeners, let's see what this name has been up to. A year ago, it was trading four sixty-five, so it's had a nice run since then. Of course, uh, it topped out right before all the madness at about seven eighty-five. That was in late February. Then it sold off down to three ninety-eight. Down in the teeth of the madness. Yeah, it looks like it hit four and a half. It closed at four and a half on March 16th. Looks like intraday may have gotten even lower. I thought 398 might have come early. I think 398 actually came in August because they were trading lower there. So they got down about four and a half in March of this year. And they pretty much rebounded right away. People realizing, I guess people want to play some mobile games. So they took off. And within, let's see, by early May, they were trading 10 and a quarter. So they rebounded nicely 
from four and a half to ten and a quarter. And they've been kind of been bouncing around this range ever since, up to ten and a half, down to, let's see, oh, eight and a half, up to ten and a half again. And recently they're on the lower end of the spectrum again, obviously down to about seven and a half. So they broke through that downside a little bit. That's where you find ourselves today in Glue Mobile. What did our Eye of Sauron find today? Oh, uh, let's see. Looks like someone may be liking themselves a little bit of the old upside. A little bit of the old bubbly here in glue. We saw the D's 11 calls. So pretty optimistic strike. I don't think in the last, yeah, the 52-week high is 1085. So they have not broken through the 11 handle yet. Someone says, you know what? This mobile love is going to continue through the end of the year. I want to get myself some of this upside to the tune of the D's 11s. 3,705 times for about 65 cents, 64.9. Their, their broker got them a little bit of a fractional savings on that 65 cent offer. These were 35 cents at 65. Go figure this guy had to pretty much pay the offer to get almost 4,000 done in a name that the ADV, I'm guessing, is far less than that. Uh, let's see. There are earnings between now and December. The next announcement, of course, going to be in November, November 5th. So not a, not a direct earnings play, but there are earnings baked into this one. So Mr. Meatball, this is kind of an old school odd block trade here. Someone coming in, a name that's had some volatility of, wait, by the way, this is an 81% IV listener. So this is not exactly cheap. <laughs> and yet looking at this name and saying, you know, I think the party is going to continue beyond its 52 week high. It's going to do it by the end of the year, and they're willing to pay some serious vol to do it. What are your thoughts on these these 11 calls in everyone's favorite Glue Mobile, Mr. Meeple? Well, I remember Glue Mobile because it was um, they had the Kim Kardashian game that was that absolutely blew up about. <laughs> of five course, years you ago. would remember and know that, sir. Yes, um, yeah. Well, you know, keeping up with the Kardashians, the game was uh, an absolute winner. Uh, they make uh, Deer Hunter, which I think you and um, Uncle Mike would like. Uh, and I think they've got some partnerships with Disney, which is, is why this, this guy, this one does well. Uh, it's interesting. Those are out of the money. Uh, they're they're uh, clearly looking for, um, you know, they're clearly looking for some real upside in this name. It's a pretty strong, uh, pretty strong move. Uh, if if they're right, I'm guessing you probably prefer to sell these than buy these, sir. I mean, I prefer not to do anything in front of earnings, but um, 81 percent vol is pretty darn juicy. Um, and uh, this is a wide market, so who knows what the actual trade was? But you know, if, if they're right, they're going to be uh, there. This thing is this is one to watch because this is ju- this is definitely like a. They have some sort of game-changing type of, of uh, uh, game-changing type of game that they're working on, and and uh, that and the stock's going to shoot higher, or it's it could be some sort of buyout play, but uh, it's definitely one to watch. All right, we're going to put it in our to be watched category. We'll be back between now and December, listening to see how this this fellow fares in Glue Mobile. Maybe they have the license to the Greasy Meatball game exclusive, and they're going to announce it tomorrow. Hence this overwhelming love in the stock. Do you, are you feeling this? You feeling this upside love, listeners? You you like this 81% of vol, this beyond 52-week high here call play? You think you'd rather sell it? Would you rather just get the heck out of Dodge? What do you think about this one? Let us know as we move on to our, our final name here. I like having some more obscure names popping in on the odd block. I mean, GM, not exactly in there, but the other two looking at it. I have Sauron taking us out now to Bright House Financial Inc., ticker symbol BHF. This is one of the largest providers of annuities and life insurance in the U.S., trading 31 and a half today, off about a quarter or not quite 1%. Uh, there's the name that's been all over the place over the last year. A year ago, it was trading 35.15, so a wee bit north of where it is right now. Topped out at 48 and a quarter right before all this madness, listeners. That was in mid-February. Then it sold off hard down to an intraday low of 12.05. That's, uh, that's pretty rough. <laughs> and then they kind of rebounded like a lot of names did pretty quickly up to 26.5 on March 26, and then back down again to 20. They were kind of up and down. A lot of fits and starts like a lot of our other names did. It wasn't straight smooth sailing for them. It was up and down, up and down. Then they peaked again in the near term. I think you can guess when that peak came. This is something we've been talking about for a while here. A lot of these... This isn't that much smaller, but still, they smaller names outside of compared to certainly to the trillion dollar fang names. Outside of those, they're certainly smaller. 
Uh, but this is a $219 billion company. So not small, but still compared to some of those other names, it's smaller. And uh, those names have all been on the nothing but upswing. June 8th, though, was the peak for a lot of those names that we talked about, the smaller names, including this one. This one peaked at 38.56 on June 8th and has never really looked back. It sold off down to 25, 25.33 in the subsequent weeks. So this one took a nice hit over 10 handles. And then now it's kind of starting to fight its way back up to 31 and a half. So June 8th, that day I've talked about before with a lot of these smaller names, a pivotal date. It certainly seems to be the case for Bright House Financial as well. Let's see what our Eye of Sauron found out here. Looks like Mr. Meatball might be a little bit of the old put love. Maybe someone thinking or worried that they have this name isn't done testing its lows because it's Jan, Jan 2021, so this coming January here. The 30 puts going up 2,500 times for $4.40. That's another pretty wide market. There were three ninety at four sixty. Looks like someone gobbled these bad boys up. If they sold them, they got a pretty darn good price for them. Uh, let's see. $4.40, 2,500 times over there on the C2, actually. That's weird. You don't see C2 listed on this uh, very often. There are earnings between now and January, of course. The next cycle is on November 2nd here. So, Mr. Meatball, this is hmm, this is an interesting one. They're paying a hefty premium. This is a 63% IV here, listeners. And $4.40 for the privilege of stopping themselves out at the 30 strike. Well, that's a pretty hefty tally. Obviously, someone, Mr. Meatball, may be thinking the worst is not over, perhaps, for Bright House. You think maybe the other side of this, you think maybe they have a great broker and they sold these bad boys to collect this line in this answer. That is some serious juice. Um you know, I, if you're a, a, a holder of a Bright House and you see this paper, you're probably not overly enthused. You know, it, it doesn't seem to bode well. Um, uh, there clearly is somebody looking for some sort of outsized move in, in the name because that's the only reason why a trade like that would go up. That is, that is some juice there and... That is a hefty premium out for, uh, you know, five months of protection. Juicy McJuicerstein, I think, as you like to say here on the show. We're going to come back to this one, too. We're going to watch this one as well. So we got a couple names to watch towards the end of the year. we got Glue and Bright House. Meanwhile, it's time to watch what you guys have in store for us. It is time for your Mail Block. It's time to take your seat on the all-star panel as we read your emails, tweets, Facebook messages, website comments, and much more. It's time for The Mail Block. All right, everybody. Welcome to The Mail Block. You guys know how to hit us up at Options, most of the major social media platforms. Questions at theoptionsinsider.com. That also works. Our website feedback form also works. Or if you want to get bumped to the top of the list, you go to our live chat. Studini taking advantage of that today. Mr. First, first, he wasn't feeling what the meatball was putting down there with the whole funness. Now, Mr. Uncle Mike, he's not feeling what you were putting down earlier. Studini, maybe he's in a bad mood out there. We'll have to lift his spirits out here because he's not buying what you were selling about uh, the legendary WWE name Kamala. He says, you know what? He's not actually from Uganda. He's from Senatobia, Mississippi. So, Mr. Uncle Mike, put that in your pipe and smoke it, sir. I mean, I'm at a loss. I mean, if you Google search Mean Gene Okerlund interviews with Kamala, the Ugandan giant, I mean, how can Kamala, the Ugandan giant, not be from Uganda? He didn't speak English. He, he, he would. It, no, I'm, I'm in disagreement on this one. Uh oh. I'm, fight, I'm fighting words. We have to take issue with uh, Stadini here in our chat after the show. First, the funness. Now he's coming for the Ugandan giant. How could WWE possibly lie about someone's geographic point of origin? It doesn't make sense. When they say parts unknown for demolition and for the ultimate warrior, it's because no one knows because there's a mystery. They, don't, they can't lie about such things. It's truth. WWE is real. Put that in your pipe and smoke it there. Uh, Stadini. All right, let's move on. We got Scott. Scott Stewart. A lot of people were chiming in about this. We were talking about this on our advisors option program not too long ago about the whole Series 7. I think someone chimed in about this last show. Someone else, another Scott, chiming in about this this time. Uh, we were talking about whether it's even got any utility for uh, options traders or options oriented advisors like Uncle Mike. Uh, Scott Stewart chiming in saying, I would submit it never had any. I passed my exam in 87 and learned absolutely nothing, in all caps, about trading from it. Yeah, that's the unfortunate side product to a lot of these 
quote unquote trading certifications. I had the same response when I first took my SIBO exam years ago. I, I expected this thing to be all about how do you trade options and what's this strategy and how do you not effectively blow out? They didn't care about any of that. It's all about the rules and regulations. They want to make sure you don't violate any securities laws. And a Series 7 has a lot of that too. They have revised it, so there are some strategy questions now too. But oftentimes these regulators are more concerned with do you know the rules and regulations and will you violate them rather than do you actually know what you're supposed to be doing that this exam is supposedly uh, certifying you for. So Mr. Uncle Mike, I know you had a – you had a, shall we say, a dismissive view of the Series 7 in the past. Uh, do you agree with Scott here that he learned absolutely nothing about trading from the Series 7, sir? Well, when I took mine, I think I took mine, oh gosh, maybe in 04, 05, 03, 04, something like that. And a, roughly 50% of it w- did have to do with option trading. And it didn't... It didn't necessarily talk about like managing risk or anything like that. It was like, what is a, a spread? Uh, if you had, if you bought a call and sold a call with these strikes, these expirations, what would that be called? That that's what a lot of it was, or roughly fifty percent of it. Because I remember when I first when I started this business with MetLife, I, I had already spent a couple of years just trading on my own, and then the Series Seven wasn't a needed thing. But if you wanted to take it, then you had to um, prove that you could. Uh, pass the practice tests and things like that. And that took a lot of studying, but I already knew that. So it was like my, I don't know, maybe a couple months into the job, I'm like, all right, I want to take it. They're like, are you crazy? And then, so I mean, I did really well on the practice test. So I just took it and I didn't really have to study for it that much at the time. Uh, and I think I got a really high grade on, I think I got like above 90 in the, in the options section of it. And then maybe like 50 and 60 everywhere else. But, um, it was just because of the options did have a lot of emphasis, at least in the era that I took it. And just for fun, I took a Series 7 test online uh, maybe a couple of years ago or like a, a practice exam because uh, we were talking about doing some type of a joint business venture with uh, a test studying company or something. And so I'm just curious. And like I said, I, I dropped my Series 7 many years ago, but it was almost no options on it at all. And so for the Series 7, at least as of now, from the last time I took a practice test a couple of years ago, uh, very minimal options on it. Uh, the other test that you take once you get a job within the industry, if you want to be an options supervisor at a firm, uh, and this is what I had, and I had all these when I worked for Options Express, um, was is the Series 4. And then you can technically be a, um, a crop, I believe is what the term is. And so... I don't even know what that stands for anymore, but uh, it's another way that you can legally supervise. Uh, and so there's a lot of things you can do, but ultimately I'm in agreement with you, Mark, most of the time on those tests, it's just a lot. It's very legal and it's not based upon uh, the everyday use of what you do within the business, at least from my experience either. And, you know, once again, I think that if you are going to be a, an, an advisor that does a lot with options, uh, you kind of got to raise your eyebrow if you're looking to advise people on something that trades so frequently. Um, if you're a self-directed broker, which uh, they're, they're kind of going the way of the floor trader these days, uh, then um, Series 7 is fine because you're not soliciting trades. But as an advisor, uh, it's kind of tough, I think. Uh, I'm very much of the school of thought that in order to be fair to the clients, regardless of what you do, I'm I'm a fee-based guy. It's like an Uncle Mike-dominated Strategy or a mail block here today. This is coming in regard to your strategy block, Mr. Uncle Mike. It comes from Trader J. Flaw. Oh, I think you wrote in he's J.F. Law. He's a, le- he's a lawyer. He's not a flaw, even though it says J. Flaw. <laughs> All right. He, this is in regard to you. You had the, what was it, the Apple diagonal call spread you were talking about on the strategy block on Monday. He responded to that when he was listening on Monday, Uncle Mike. He said he sold the covered calls of the January 175 strike on LVGO, this is Livongo Health, uh, and they're trading 121.74 right now. He said, I sold it before the merger when the stock was 148. So he probably got some pre- pretty decent juice on those Jan calls. Uh, he goes on to write, the stock probably would have been called away with a blowout earnings. I had bought the stock at 112, so he's still looking good. Uh, I'm watching covered call bleed slowly down, but also my stock purchase profits was holding and not closing out the whole position uh, dumb. So he bought the stock at 112, 
The stock rallied to 148 before some merger talks. He sold a covered call against it, and now the stock is back down to about 122, a little bit shy of that, 121 and three quarters. Obviously, hindsight, a bit of 2020 there, Trader J.F. Law, 79 to get your full handle out there. Obviously, that's one of those ones we talked about before with some other ones. Usually, it's a long premium we have to worry about getting out in a short amount of time, but this in this case... Yeah, it's a bit of a challenging one. I'm not sure. Mr. Uncle Mike, it's not exactly a diagonal. It's more of a uh, straight-up uh, covered call that he sold on this uh, Livongo Health. But what do you have to say here for Trader JF Law 79 since he's asking you? Was he dumb? No, you're not dumb. I mean, we're all uh, – typically the reason that you sell a covered call after a run-up, or at least the reason that I ever would, would be because I'm looking to maybe get out of it in the near term and – think it might stay up there for a little bit, maybe capitalize on some premium in the meantime. But uh, uh, you're smarter than if you would have just held the stock. So, I mean, that's one way of looking at it. Um, I, so, no, I don't think it's necessarily dumb. Uh, but uh, when doing that, I think that we're, if you're still in the position right now, uh, Mr. Law, uh, what I would look at would be, or Mrs. Law, or whatever, uh, would be, what is your current sentiment on the underlying? Are you currently bullish, bearish, or neutral? And then take a view on this and take a position that's appropriate. Uh, if you're currently bearish on it, you're just waiting until the covered call premium get bleeds out to get out of it, then I don't think that's right. I think that if you are bullish, bearish, or neutral, adjust your position accordingly, dependent upon how you are today. Yeah, your outlook may have certainly changed post this merger announcement and the earnings wasn't a blowout, it sounds like. So your outlook may certainly have changed. You'll be trying to squeeze the last couple of cents out of that 175 call, which I'm guessing doesn't have a lot of juice on it. Probably at least take that off. Not a lot, a lot to cost you to buy that bad boy back and maybe you could, you could reconsider the underlying position going forward. Uh, let's see. Speaking of going forward, Stadini, he's not feeling what we're putting down here. He, <laughs> we were teasing him about the Kamal. He says, well, he says, well, geez. It's just a nickname. It is WWE after all. <laughs> yes. Yes, we get that. We were joking with you, Stadini. Uh, by the way, my producer did track down what he's talking about here. Uh, his name was, I guess, Harris, and he was born in Senatobia, Mississippi. He grew up in Coldwater, Mississippi, uh, where he, had, he got in trouble, and he got kicked out of town after his father was shot dead during a dice game. Uh, he left high school in ninth game, became a habitual burglar. So a rough run here for Kamala uh, he got kicked out of town later then by the, by the police. He met a wrestler named Bobo Brazil who changed his life, brought him to the WWE, and he uh, was on from there. So there we go. The life of the late, <laughs> late uh, Kamala here in WWE. And yes, it is just WWE after all, Studdini. So yeah, we're, we agree with you. As we keep on rolling into our final segment, it is time to go around the block. It's time to tell you what we'll be watching on our trading screens until the next episode. It's time for Around the Block. <laughs> Who knew we had such a literal audience out there today? Mr. Mr. Meatball, let's start with you. So this is, of course, a segment where we go around the block, tell people what we're watching until the next time we can gather here together on this show on Monday or maybe in your case tomorrow for volatility views. What is on your radar these days, sir? You know, I'm going to be watching the NASDAQ. It, it kind of got punched, and now it's been recovering the last couple of days. Um, so that is going to be kind of my main focus. I, I'm going to be watching, obviously, some economics. And then I'm going to wonder, you know, has, has our friend that's been complaining about Kamala, uh, Kamala the, the Ugandan warrior, ever actually listened to the show before? Because um, none of these comments from us – should come off as any type of surprise and or, you know, he, he's basically railing against our MO as a, as a <laughs> operating, uh, operating podcast. <laughs> that name does look familiar. He has been in there before. So he clearly has listened to more than one episode of the option block. Maybe it's like a Rush Limbaugh thing. Maybe they hate listen. Like the old data used to put out about Rush Limbaugh. People who leaned right listened for about 20 minutes. People who leaned left listened for like 50 minutes because they hated it so much. Maybe that's the case. Maybe he hate listens. Either way, he's been in there before. Uh, but maybe he doesn't get our, our unique brand of sarcasm here and irony and just jest. On the option block. Mr. Uncle Mike, same question for you, sir. What are you watching for uh, the rest of this week until we can gather here together on Monday, sir? 
Well, the name Bobo Brazil struck a chord with me because I actually saw Bobo Brazil as a first grader. He came to the bar, the Alamo in Aurora, Illinois, and my dad took me to the wrestling matches at the Alamo in Aurora, Illinois, back when I was in first grade. So I got to see Bobo Brazil, who not many people know this, is the master of the Cocoa Butt back in 1983, live, ringside. But I digress. Uh, what I'm watching, uh, seeing if we can get above the all-time highs. It's definitely going to be a point of resistance, and uh, seeing where we're at with that. Uh, of course, watching if we can get another stimulus deal, whether that happens or not. Uh, watching to see if we still have payroll tax. and Oh, yeah, we got this whole COVID thing going on as well. Uh, so that is what I'm looking at. Interesting. That music, of course, listeners means we're done. I did not. I, did, I was not aware of this Bobo Brazil character, let alone that he had uh, such an impact on a young Uncle Mike. There you go. Uncle Mike checking out Bobo Brazil and a young, impressionable age. If you want to compare childhood WWE experiences as we wrap up the show, I went to one show when I was a kid. I'll just put this out there. Back in Connecticut. The main event, Andre the Giant versus the Ultimate Warrior. Yes, I saw those two fight for real as a kid, and it was amazing. For real in WWE quotes, of course. That was the highlight of my uh, youthful WWE experience. <laughs> it was a very WWE heavy show. I blame our audience for dragging us down this crazy road. If you want more in your ear holes, probably less WWE talk coming up in a little bit, then stay tuned for Twifo. We'll have some great guests joining me on that one to break down all the things going on in the world of futures options. Going to talk rates options. Going to talk equities and volatility there. Probably some energy. Who knows what else is going to make it on? FX, AGs, you never know. you got to tune into the show to find out. But before we go... Let's go back around the horn. Let's start with Uncle Mike, who is probably wishing right now he saw Ultimate Warrior versus Andre the Giant live. Uh, Mr. Uncle Mike, sir, what is, uh, if folks, actually, we know what you're watching. If folks are intrigued, they want to kick the tires. Maybe they want to call you up to argue the geographic origins of famous WWE stars. Oh, where should they go? What should they do? If you want to do that, go to stcharleswealth.com. I would be more than happy to work with uh, anyone. I am an option-based financial advisor in a lot of cases. Uh, that What I mean by that is a lot of my clients have options in their portfolios, and uh, it's a tool that I use very frequently if it's appropriate, of course. Uh, but visit my website, stcharleswealth.com, to find out more information. And I say that jokingly, but I would not be surprised if you get an email or two or perhaps a phone call saying, this guy was from here. How dare you say that? Or maybe I, too, saw Bobo Brazil as a child. I don't know. I would not be surprised if a few of those come your way before the next episode. And Mr. Meatball, if folks want to call you up, maybe to talk options or volatility, or maybe to also debate various WWE legends with you, uh, where should they go? What should they do, sir? Yeah, you know, I've never went to a WWE event. I went to a yeah, ECW event back in the day when they oh, were at... Uh, that, that's hardcore. Yeah, and well, when I went to school in Philly, I went to an ECW match. Uh, saw the Blue Meanie. Which was uh, kind of my favorite part of the, the whole thing in Sabu. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, go to Occupy.com. We put out free content by email uh, almost every day. All good volatility based stuff, some, some good trading thoughts for you as well. And, uh, and uh, you know, go there, give us your email, and we will, uh, uh, and we will uh, we'll go from there. Stay tuned for his newsletters exploring the origins of all of your favorite WWE stars. Optionpit.com is the place to go. Sign up for that email. And on behalf of the Greasy Meatball and Uncle Mike and myself, thank all of you out there for downloading and streaming and subscribing and sending in your questions and listening live, even if you disagree with us vehemently. And indeed, all the other fun stuff that you do. Remember, you got more coming. Got some great guests joining us, including a guy from RJO over there to get some insight into what's trading. On the futures options, boots on the ground side there with all things futures options should be fun. On Twifo in a little bit. If you're listening live, we'll pump some fun stuff in in between. We'll be back in exactly a half an hour for Twifo. If you're listening after the fact, then of course click next because you got Twifo coming up. And then of course you got Vol Views tomorrow, 1 p.m. Central, 2 p.m. Eastern. Then we do it all again on Monday with more of the options. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. 
Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. <laughs> 